I'm on the horns of a dilemma here. I've been given a page of things that I'm supposed to read and a lighting system that makes it almost impossible for me to see them, but I'll, I'll try to do the best I can. Uh, all of you uh, by now will know from the fact that you attend movies and attend conferences that you should turn off your cell phones, or at the very least be sure that you put them on quiet. And for everyone on the panel, apparently cell phones may interfere with the microphone, so we should all turn ours off. Um, there'll be 45 minutes of networking time at the end of this session. It will not be in this room, so don't hang around in this room. Does anybody know? Joe, are you there? Out there somewhere? Yes. Do you know where the networking session is going to be held? <coughs> the Capitol Terrace room? Great. That's where we will all be. Hopefully, that's where we're supposed to be. Um, at the end, there will be a question and answer period. Please either wait for a microphone or go to a microphone. This is all being filmed, which is why we have John Belushi at the end of the panel here in his sunglasses. Um, and that's probably it for getting started. Um, how about each of the panelists giving a 30-second uh, description of themselves with the most colorful thing you can think of to say about yourself? Steve, would you start that? Yeah, uh, well, do I, need I say anything? <laughs> uh, let me tell you, uh, well, I'll tell you about how I got interested in global warming. Uh, in 2005, I went to a conference sponsored by Yale University in Aspen called Climate Change. Uh, you know, it was about climate change and public opinion. And the point of having the conference with was how come it is that that so many people believe that global warming is occurring and climate change is occurring because of CO2, uh, but it doesn't gain any traction in the public as an important problem. Uh, more people are concerned about religion in schools, uh, same-sex marriage, than they were about global warming, according to the public opinion polls in October 2005. And uh, this was a group of uh, lawyers, and Al Gore was there, and politicians, Bob Carey, uh, and uh, press people, uh, and uh, business people. Uh, and as a result, uh, I went because my wife was an organizer, but I kept thinking, reading the papers that they got, and I said, you know, this sounds like tobacco. Uh, clearly, the science is all one way, but the companies are still saying it ain't true, it ain't happening. Uh, and therefore, there may, in the tobacco cases, I was offered an opportunity to represent the plaintiffs. I turned it down and represented Philip Mars for five years. And so how many times do you get to change, you know, redeem yourself by for once in your life being on the right side of the docket? And I was thinking, this might be an opportunity, because I'll be on the plaintiff's side in, in the climate cases. So I went, I left there, I made a lot of noise there that you know, people were talking about making profit by being green. I said, you'll never do that. The business people, I said, you'll never do that unless I sue you a few times, because that'll encourage you to be green. And I was not welcome there at all. And someone heard that there was a lawyer there Obviously, I was not an invited guest and heard that there was a trial lawyer there, and then they wanted to interview me for some environmental magazine. And I was talking about climate change litigation, and all of a sudden, I made myself into the biggest expert in the world. <laughs> environmental, by the way, that's something you can do. I'm telling you, the students, just look for opportunities to make yourself famous. And this was like, fell in my lap. I didn't have a global warming case or a climate change case or a client, but I pretended to be an expert and I was invited to attend things like this. And then, you know, all of a sudden, two mayors in Texas, Mayor White of Houston and the mayor of Dallas called me and they asked me whether I would represent 37 cities in Texas which were fighting coal burning generating plants. Now, they are the biggest culprits. But you're not able to fight them in Texas, at least, on the basis of the carbon dioxide that they put in the air. You fight them on other things that they do bad in the, in the environment. But of course, the effect of shutting them down, 11 plants, the effect of not letting them be built was to save the atmosphere, because they, they are the worst offenders. 
So I did that on a pro bono, pro bono basis, and then one thing led to another, and then I began, uh, you know, I had a course in global warming litigation, it taught it in the evening at the University of Houston Law School, and before I knew it, I was like, and I kept telling lawyers in my firm, we all did all this work on a pro bono basis, including the Kivalina case, which we are doing now, which is the only real global warming case that's going on. I can explain that later on. We're doing it. My firm's doing it on a pro bono basis, and we spent millions of dollars, and people say, why in the hell are we doing this? And my point is that, well, I want to be in the right place. I want to be on the sweet spot when something good happens in this area of the law. Now, it has not happened yet, and it's looking increasingly unlikely that it will happen because by 2008, instead of 30% of the people believing climate change was a problem, which was the number in 2005, it had gone to 80%. Public opinion was turned around. It is now, the public opinion is less than 30%. It's been a total improved, and now it's horrible again. So it's, it's just the American public is very fickle. And, uh, but that's how I got interested in this whole area. You know, that, longer that, than you wanted. That, that, that was so much more interesting than I expected, uh, as, where I thought this was just going to be a kind of a waft through credentials, uh, that why don't we not do the 30-second thing and boost it up to two or three minutes apiece? Michael, you want to go next? Okay. Well, I teach uh, environmental law at Columbia Law School and uh, head the Center for Climate Change Law. But I guess um, I'll just mention one particular project we're working on. Um, about two years ago, we were approached by the ambassador to the United Nations from the Republic of the Marshall Islands. And he said, some decade, we don't know which it is, but some decade we're going to be underwater. And when that happens, it raises a whole host of novel legal issues. Uh, if a country is underwater, is it still a state? Does it still have a seat at the United Nations? Who's going to take in our people? What will their citizenship be? What rights will they have when they get there? Uh, what happens to our fishing rights and our mineral rights under our exclusive, exclusive economic zone? Do we have any legal recourse against the people who did this to us? What are the answers to these questions, Mike? I did not have them in my, in my pocket, but it, it launched us on a, 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 on a journey to really look into the legal issues faced by threatened island nations. Now, these nations are really the tip of the iceberg is an unfortunate expression here in this context, but, uh, but they're, uh, they're just the, the faintest element of uh, uh, the smallest element of the global problem of climate migration, climate uh, displacement. The total number of people in these small island nations that are a meter or two above sea level are about half a million. Within the global scheme of migration, that's not a big number. But the same kind of conditions that would cause those nations to go under will also have horrific effects on places like Bangladesh and the Mekong Delta, the Nile Delta, other parts of the world where you have truly large numbers and very often are large numbers of people and often political systems that will not necessarily welcome large numbers of people crossing borders. And so as I think about sort of the downside and what it is we're trying to avoid in the, in the decades to come, it's that kind of issue that is really uh, extremely concerning uh, in conjunction with, uh, with a thousand other effects that it will have. But why don't I stop there and, and say that's one area where we're working. Good. And, and it's, it's worth saying uh, that all of those affected populations that Michael was describing are poor uh, and for the most part powerless and for the most part not doing anything to create this problem. But in the sense of justice, I'll also point out that Dubai has now spent $20 billion building more of these islands offshore, a meter above, and putting luxury condominiums in it so that the jet setters can fly their private jets creating the problem that are going to cost them in the next 25 or 30 years to lose that entire investment. There may be a god. Uh, Adriana. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Um, I apologize for my voice. I lost it somewhere in my travel over here. But um, I am Adriana Quinter, and I work with the Natural Resources Defense Council. And um, I, I feel among the, in this panel like I came to this issue late in the game. Um, I've been with NRDC for 14 years now, but I worked on litigation uh, around toxics and air quality and water quality. 
and all of which tie into this issue regardless. But I, I had never been directly involved in the issue of climate change other than peripherally until 2008, 2009, when uh, for the one of the first meaningful considerations of passing some type of climate le uh, legislation. And um, up till then, I had been a litigator, and I'd been doing some work reaching out to communities on um, the need to make sure that these communities were protected from t toxics in our air and our water, things like that. Uh, make sure that the environmental justice aspect of things was looked at. So when I came to the climate debate, I was very surprised to find a big division uh, among the climate justice community and the climate change community. Um, so even within the environmental community, I just noticed that there was a lot of, of, of fracturing. Um, my job at the time was was how do I bridge this? My, the question to myself was how do I how do I bridge this gap and how do I make it so that we don't defeat ourselves? Um, and ultimately, these communities that so many are fighting so hard to protect. Uh, and I found that to be a really big challenge uh, because of the way that the U.S. at the time was approaching climate legislation. Um, and the question still remains, how are we going to solve this problem? Ultimately, these communities, like these islands here in the US, are suffering the brunt of the pollution and the carbon pollution spe specifically and air toxics that go along with coal-fired power plants. Um, so it's a problem that must be solved, regardless of whether or not um, some choose to bury their head in the sand as to whether or not climate change is a reality. But what I found was that there was common ground. and. Um, as long as we got away from debating whether or not the solution was a singular cap and trade uh, law, we were able to find uh, solutions that would work for people and that would ultimately help communities as well. And um, what was most important and most refreshing was that in doing so, I learned just how uh, important it is to make sure that we are engaging all communities in these fights, whether it's on climate change or other environmental battles, because for too long the environmental community has been very insulated and very um, monochromatic, and I use that <laughs> word intentionally. <laughs> and, and being able to diversify that and bring different voices and different faces and different colors to the discussion in Washington made a tremendous amount of difference and finally was able to get people to at least take meetings that were otherwise being denied. So, uh, you know, later on in the discussion we can talk a little bit more about how that plays in. But um, I think that that part of our solution to this issue is taking a, a, a closer zip code by zip code look as to how these impacts are going to affect us in the future and what um, each of these communities have uh, that can contribute to those solutions, whether that's uh, fighting a singular coal-fired power plant of the community or supporting nationwide uh, legislation or litigation for that matter. So um, it, it's just, it, I think that there's hope ultimately, uh, but we need to get creative. Jonathan. Okay, um, I'm Jonathan Adler at, at Case Western Reserve University. Um, in terms of things that are, that I guess are interesting, um, I've been working on, on climate and other environmental issues now for over 20 years, and, and in that time, um, appeared to discuss environmental policy on Entertainment Tonight and debated the Beach Boys on national television, <laughs> um, which off camera resulted in the interesting exchange where one of the members of that band, who will remain nameless, uh, turned to me and said that, that uh, uh, he considers himself to be essentially a member of Earth First because, and he held up his, his hands, which were adorned with, I think virtually every finger adorned with a, a gem-bearing ring, saying, well, because, uh, of course I get the Earth First because I, I, I wear her products on my fingers. And um, I realized he didn't know much about mining. Um, I'm, I'm probably, I'm not the only person on this panel, but pro I think the only person on the conference program who's been awarded a, a, a or got, received an award from the Federalist Society for a scholarship, or has written a, a cover story for National Review, and as it happens, on, on, on global warming. Um, and in terms of my work on this issue, I guess one way to characterize it is that most of my work on environmental policy deals with trying to reconcile a concern for environmental protection with uh, both uh, what one could, one could characterize as, as uh, traditional conceptions of 
the importance of limited government, constitutional limitations on federal power, uh, economic freedom, and individual liberty. And that's, that's obviously a daunting task. Um, but that's, that's the, the direction from which I come on, on these and other issues. And, and in the climate change area in particular, um, a concern that um, it's an issue that most folks approach with a certain set of priors that dictate their, their policy preferences that have, and that these policy preferences tend to have very little to do at the end of the day with the actual concern, which is stabilizing atmospheric concentrations of greenhouse gases, because whatever else we do or, do or don't do on climate change, if we don't reach some type of atmospheric stabilization, for climate change purposes, it doesn't matter. Uh, and that's something that I think is generally absent from most discussions of climate change uh, across the political spectrum. Thank you. And um, I, I'm Dennis Hayes. I'm going to be doing somewhat the same sort of thing, but with a cognizance that uh, Steve Sussman has said correctly that we liberals and, and others uh, need to stop whining and complaining about what's happened and ask what we're going to do now. But I, I think it might help a little bit to spend just a minute or two framing a bit about the background of this issue, particularly for some of the younger people in the class or those that got engaged more recently in it, uh, to let you know a little bit about the roots of what we're going to be discussing. I jumped into climate change as a believer in the science of it in 1978 in the course of two long weekend walks with a guy named Steve Schneider, who was then the head of the climate program at the National Center for Atmospheric Research. Uh, I'd been aware of the issue before, but it was sort of peripheral to my consciousness, and by the end of the second walk, uh, Steve had convinced me that, that this was going to be one of the two or three defining issues of our era. In 1979-80, that winter session of the American Association for the Advancement of Science, I gave a, a plenary keynote, which was all based on the assumption that global warming was real and how we were going to be able to deal with it and what was the time frame and the policies that might get us through it. Um, in an audience of about 3,000 scientists, there was no real dissent. Um, everybody then knew that this would be a huge undertaking. The world runs on oil and gas and coal. But we had 50 years to accomplishment, and that was back in the era when America still did things. I mean, we were still sort of in the waft of having mobilized the entire economy, the entire society to win World War II. And we built an interstate highway system, and we put a man on the moon. President Carter, uh, sort of like President Nixon with his project Independence ahead of him, um, believed that this issue was really important, had a different set of policies than Nixon was promoting, but both of them thought that this was something that we would jump into. Carter announced a goal of 20% of the nation's energy from renewable energy by 2000. Uh, what's often forgotten in that is that it's 20% of a super efficient economy, so you're going to be investing a lot in efficiency and getting a fifth of the remaining demand. And um, I was in charge of the group that put together a, a bunch of national labs and major universities to come up with the policies that would actually implement that. And in the end, what we produced, according to our calculations, if they had in fact been implemented, we would have gotten something north of 25% by the year 2000. Now, you have to remember that this really was a different kind of era. There was no whining and complaining about stuff. In the environment, uh, in that period between <coughs> 1970 and the time we're talking about, say 1980, we passed the Clean Air Act, the Clean Water Act, the Endangered Species Act, uh, the Environmental Education Act, NOAA, set up the EPA, um, had Superfund, RICRA, FIFRA. Uh, it, it was just an amazing period in which things were virtually unstoppable. Uh, legislation, some of it passing uh, almost, oh, in, in, in the case of the Clean Air Act, with two dissenting votes in one chamber and, and by a voice vote in the other. Um, and apparently in 1972, when Richard Nixon vetoed the Clean Water Act, uh, Congress went back and overrode him. A very, very different era than the one we have today. In 1980, Ronald Reagan was elected president. He attempted to eliminate the Department of Energy. He crushed the programs to research, develop, and promote clean energy. In the laboratory that I was running, he reduced our budget by about 80%, fired all of our contractors in one afternoon, including two that went on to win Nobel Prizes later, and reduced my staff by 50%. It was incredibly brutal to people that I had 
spent months recruiting to leave their tenured professorships and come out and join this Manhattan Project for a renewable future. Instead, they were left brutalized in a way that was seemingly intended to drive them from the field. The conservative onslaught then was sweeping and comprehensive, and liberals, as we proudly called ourselves back in those days, found it difficult to focus on an issue that was popularly visualized as two lines crossing on a graph some 50 years out in the future. People were suffering now, and elections came every two years, and this just wasn't a priority uh, among really much of anyone. The rest of the world awakened to the issue. An agreement of sorts was pounded out in Kyoto to take some modest steps to reduce CO2 emissions. The agreement was reached in 1997, and the protocol became effective in 2005. Today, 197 nations have ratified it. The only ones that have not are Andorra, Afghanistan, and South Sudan, and, of course, the United States of America. President Obama campaigned fairly strongly on climate issues, and although the White House played a fairly destructive role, in my view, on the cap-and-trade bill, its actions were a little bit like stabbing a corpse. The bill never had the clout to overcome the economic and ideological interests arrayed against it. Um, Mitt Romney, when he was elected governor, held views on climate and energy that one would have expected of a relatively smart, relatively well-educated business leader. And he was an early supporter of the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative in New England, but when he decided to run for the presidency, he renounced all of those views and ultimately withdrew Massachusetts from Reggie, though it has since gone back in. So that's where we are today, and where do we go from here? Michael, uh, how do you see this issue playing out nationally if Governor Romney wins the presidential election? Well, I guess... I, one major concern is that if, if Governor Romney wins the presidential election, that also suggests that the complexion of the Congress will be similar to what it is now. Um, and what that suggests is that, in the first place, there's obviously no hope of affirmative legislation on uh, climate change. But more importantly, most of the good things that are happening uh, in the United States on climate legislation are because uh, President Obama has directed uh, Lisa Jackson, the head of EPA, to be uh, moving forward with um, uh, implementation of the uh, Clean Air Act as it applies to climate change. As the U.S. Supreme Court said in Massachusetts versus EPA in 2007, that it could. What uh, I fear uh, would happen in that situation is a reversion to what we had under uh, uh, the second President Bush, uh, uh, which was that maybe there are a lot of studies done, uh, but not a lot of uh, regulation. It would be a very easy matter for uh, EPA to to be forced to retrench on what it's doing on the on the regulatory side, and so I think uh, uh, the United States is already sort of a uh, you know trailing the industrialized world in a number of these areas, and, and that I think it would be a, a, a terrible uh, setback if that were to happen, recognizing that the um, instructions that uh, we were given before this talk had very stringent requirements against any election-related discussion. <laughs> so we are not in favor of any candidate, but I, I think it's entirely legitimate in a 501c3 to ask about the implications, and I'd like to ask that of, of Jonathan. What will happen? I mean, it's... I'll say a couple of things. One, I don't think a Romney administration administratively could undo the bulk of what the Obama administration has done under the Clean Air Act, because I think the way the Clean Air Act is structured, um, most of that has to uh, take place. Uh, that this is not a question of, of administrative discretion. Um, given conclusions that the EPA has already reached, there's no way to undo the endangerment finding. And then as a consequence, there's no way to undo uh, most of the rulemakings that uh, the EPA has conducted, in, and if anything, um, there are more that EPA could be forced to do or engage in uh, without regard to who is president. Among other things, you know, there is a petition pending at EPA that has still, I believe, not been acted upon to require the agency to set a national ambient air quality standard for carbon dioxide. Um, and there is a reasonable likelihood that a suit to force action on that petition could succeed, again, without regard to who's elected. Um, the, the big wild card uh, in terms of what uh, President Romney would do is what the D.C. Circuit does with the litigation over uh, the EPA's greenhouse gas regulations that's, in the, that's uh, we're awaiting a decision on right now. Um, I think a lot of people expect that the bulk of what EPA has done will be upheld. 
but that's something called the tailoring rule, which is an effort to, to put it nicely, uh, reinterpret very clear statutory language in a, in a uh, innovative way, which basically involves, among other things, adding multiple zeros to, to numerical thresholds that Congress wrote directly into the law so as to avoid uh, forcing EPA to uh, have to try and regulate far beyond its capacity by its own, by its own account. Um, if that gets struck down, um, then the question, then, then there will be, uh, no matter who's president, um, a tremendous amount of pressure on the agency because the agency will be in a position where it is legally obligated to do something that, again, by its own account, it cannot do. That is, the Obama administration has said that, that implementing the letter of the Clean Air Act to stationary sources, to buildings and such, and factories and such that emit greenhouse gases, cannot be done because the staff, the staffing and other requirements for doing that are just too large. And then the question becomes what Congress looks like, because only Congress can fix that. And um, whether or not Congress would fix that by simply removing regulatory authority over greenhouse gases from EPA, which is one possibility, or by uh, engaging in some sort of bargain where EPA loses that authority in, in exchange for something else. And, and until we know what the Congress looks like, that's anyone's guess. Hmm. So the election outcome is almost irrelevant on this? In your opinion. Almost. I mean, because the, you know, the Clean Air Act, I mean, a President Obama would probably veto an effort to remove uh, EPA authority over greenhouse gases. A President Romney uh, would almost certainly sign such legislation. He, I, I believe, has already said or in what, he is, there is at least Romney campaign literature that says he supports removing um, uh, EPA authority over greenhouse gases under the Clean Air Act. And many of us have been clinging to this, this, this hope that the Etch-a-Sketch might have, have be here as well. Steve, uh, there have been I various... Oh, you want to jump on this one, yeah, too? I don't think it's irrelevant at all. I mean, I think the result will... Two justices on the Supreme Court, uh, 100 vacancies on the federal district court benches will be filled by... Uh, very conservative jurist. And so, you know, using law as a tool to do anything about clean air and kiss that goodbye. Now, I do not think Obama's election is going to cause any real, ch I mean, at least it'll mean that, uh, that it's possible someday to fight for clean air in the courts. Uh, but, but now no one's in a mood. The economy's too bad. That people, as long as they can't pay their mortgages and can't pay for their food bill, they don't really care about how dirty they're. I mean, most people don't. That's the problem. We got, we, we were, we were dealt just when people were getting concerned about climate change in 2008, and we had a president who was concerned about it too, we're dealt this horrible blow of an economy that became awful. And therefore, you know, there are people, good people, good meaning people that, and, you know, we just, we got to, I, I mean, even my friends really think that to force businesses to do much on climate change right now on CO2 emissions would be a mistake, bad for the economy. I mean, even the progressive community. Uh, I think that, uh, uh, I mean, I, I do think there it will be a role for lawyers using state law frequently uh, in states that are friendly uh, and uh, that uh, we definitely have to keep vigilant about. I mean, 40 percent, as I recall the numbers, 40 percent of greenhouse gases are put in the atmosphere by uh, coal-burning electric generating plants. Uh, and, you know, they, there, there really is, there's no such thing as clean coal. Uh, there are different, and I don't think we're about to stop burning coal. I mean, I think we're most likely, but we can capture carbon. There are technologies that are available today. So, I mean, I think the lawyers have got to be vigilant, frequently on a pro bono basis, in their own communities, working with municipalities, with counties, with the environmental organizations as allies, because they need help too, because, to fight these uh, efforts to get permitted these coal plants after we beat the 30s after we won uh, against the 11 TXU plants in Texas and Robert Redford did a movie called 
David versus Goliath, the Texas Coal Wars. Uh, some other company came in and wanted to build a plant uh, and get permits to build a plant near Corpus Christi, and that was just decided within the last three or four months. Uh, and a state trial judge in Austin, Texas, uh, ruled that they couldn't, they hadn't satisfied, they can't build a plant. So that was a great victory for us. Uh, Steve, yes. we're, we're going to come back because we've yeah. got a whole bunch of litigation questions I'd like to toss at you. Okay. Adriana had one final comment she wanted to make on the presidential thing, and then yeah. we'll move on. I thank you. I was just going to add that it really, really does matter. I, don't, I think I have to disagree um, that it doesn't matter. I think, I think you're right. It does matter tremendously, mostly because of the makeup of Congress. Congress right now is actively, every single victory we've had, the victory last, last year on mercury and air toxics, is currently up for a, a battle through, uh, I won't say names, through a CRA that's being proposed. So we are, every victory that has happened is being attacked, and every opportunity that that Congress has right now to uh, diminish EPA's power or to kill the Clean Air Act in some way is being used. So absolutely, this election is very important for the environment. Can I just say something really quickly on, on that subject? Uh, Jonathan is right that the Clean Air Act compels many of the regulatory actions that EPA is taking. However, the Clean Air Act does not regulate the pace at which they're taking. And I think exactly. one huge difference is that if, if you had a Romney presidency, it would be like pulling teeth. It'd be similar to what we see, what we saw with the listing of the polar bear under the Endangered Species Act under Bush, that at every step there had to be a new lawsuit, and it took years and years and years. So I think that's what we would have. They would follow the law eventually uh, up under uh, judicial compulsion. Or perhaps do what they did in energy efficiency way back then, too, with the no standard standard, which was just the, the, the classic way to avoid things. Steve, you have invested a lot of time, energy, intellect, and money in litigating this. And... I've gotten the impression in conversations from you that you don't see that as holding a lot of hope in the future. And could you just tell us briefly, is that a correct perception? And if so, why? And if not, is there going to be a role for litigators, perhaps under some of those state laws you were describing? Yeah, I think, well, the answer is, no, I don't think there's going to be much role for litigators doing the common law nuisance kind of cases, the nuisance cases. And the problem there is that even if we get through all of the hoops, the preliminary hoops that keep us from even engaging in discovery, you can't get personal jurisdiction in an American court over companies that account for more than about 7% of CO2 emissions worldwide. And so you take the case of Kivalina. I mean, I'm thinking through Kivalina, okay? Suppose we, suppose I mean, in a way, we have been blessed by the fact that we haven't had to spend a fortune on discovery on a pro bono basis thus far. Uh, we've been blessed it's all briefing thus far. But if we have added to discovery, what, what are the stakes here? I mean, they, the Corp engineer says, you know, 100 to 400 million, let's say $300 million to move this native village to the mainland because the Kivalina Island is going underwater. Um, well, do you get 7% of $300 million? Uh, that's $21 million. That's, that ain't worth the manpower that's going to take to do this lawsuit because it's going to take a lot of expert testimony on causation. Uh, I mean, can you hold the bad guys jointly and severally liable uh, for all the damage? Is there any new theory of personal jurisdiction that you can use? I mean, why can't we sue the... Chinese polluters or the Indian uh, emitters uh, in the United States for the damage that they are doing to the atmosphere that's doing harm in the United States. I mean, these are the kind of theories, but this is on the fringe of the law. And so I worry that, that uh, I don't have a lot of hope uh, that this litigation is going to go uh, very far, uh, even if we do. Now, will there be other kinds of litigation involving yeah, I mean, that's why I'm still in it. You know, I want to be there. I want to be, I want people to call me when the other kinds of litigation. You know, it may be disputes over cap and trade. It may be disputes, I mean, people have thought now, okay, that uh, the, the publicly held companies are not making the proper disclosures about their environmental exposure, about their liabilities, about what might happen, and uh, that there will be securities fraud cases that could be brought against them for 
failure to disclose facts that would be material to an investor. Um, that, you know, but of course, the Supreme Court is likely to close down, I mean, unless change, we're likely to get the securities litigation closed down. So I'm not, I'm not, uh, I'm not real optimistic. Michael. Well, I agree with Steve that the common law litigation doesn't have a bright future, but can I just tick through seven other ways that I think litigation can play a constructive role? Uh, first, compelling uh, implementation of the existing statutes, as Massachusetts versus EPA and many of the other uh, cases that we're now seeing. Secondly, as, as Steve has done, uh, litigating on blocking terrible new projects that, that construction of new coal-fired power plants has pretty much been shut down, but we have other phenomena such as the uh, construction of infrastructure that in view of the declining demand for coal in the United States because of uh, environmental regulations and the cheap uh, price of natural gas, it's going to allow the export of large quantities of U.S. coal to China. I think that's a, uh, a prime ground for uh, litigation. A third is shutting down the existing bad projects that were built long ago, including many of the uh, grandfathered uh, uh, CO2 belching uh, power plants that are all around the country. Um, fourth is facilitating the construction of good new projects. If we're going to meet our greenhouse gas reduction goals, we're going need, to gonna need a lot of wind and a lot of solar and a lot of geothermal and other things. And one thing that the environmental community has been very poor at is promoting the good projects as opposed to fighting the bad uh, uh, projects. Uh, number five, uh, um, Steve mentioned the compelling uh, uh, disclosure. I think that even if SEC doesn't take action, there are some state blue sky laws that uh, particularly if you had vigorous state attorney generals could be used. And also the National Environmental Policy Act is a powerful and greatly underutilized tool to require energy efficiency uh, and other measures as uh, part of uh, projects. Uh, uh, sixth is potential liability for distortions in um, in, in, in the science in the same way that the tobacco industries had uh, came to grief ultimately. And finally, um, uh, and I think this is one area where uh, Jonathan and I likely agree, is on the adaptation side, on getting ready for the climate change that is coming and, tr and preventing, for example, the construction of, uh, of, of, of big projects in areas that are about to drown, that are about to be underwater, that we have all kinds of perverse subsidies that, that uh, encourage uh, coastal development in areas that we know are, are, are not going to be around um, in, in a few decades. And I think that there are a lot of litigation angles that are potentially available there. Anywhere so, there are fees available? <laughs> <laughs> not nearly to your ideal extent, Steve. Good. Thank you very much. That was both very thoughtful comments. Two, two quick remarks on it, if I may. Um, one is I, I really hope that there are successful lawsuits with regard to the coal exports because at the moment we've got a few tens of thousands of people who are thinking about civil disobedience as a way to stop it and it would be neat to not have them all writing their letters from prison. Uh, second, there is an argument at least that this is the way that things are supposed to play out in the United States. This, this is a giant <laughs> undertaking that we're going here. I mean, America was built on cheap oil, and if we're going to be moving off of oil and off of coal and increasingly off of gas, uh, that's the kind of thing that ought to have broad consensus. When, when we had all of those environmental bills that I was talking about in the early 1970s, it was because there was a broad sense in the nation that this is the direction we wanted to go, that progress had become disassociated with things that we cared about as a society. I think it's, it's incumbent not just upon people who are formally professional environmentalists, but all of us that, that care about the future, to try to build that consensus around this issue so that you can pass laws rather than trying to somehow lump together a bunch of theories that might be able to get you a, a chance of getting some progress in some court with the right judge someplace. We ought to be able to pass a law that just makes it clear that this is the new direction that we're heading. Um, so much for my impartial moderation. Jonathan, um, there, you, you have done a lot of thinking and writing about ways that, that markets can promote environmental well-being and that regulatory approaches have, have, have failed or at least been flawed in their approaches to it. Is that something that in the climate arena, as a global issue, 
that, that you can, and, and without having a carbon tax and without having a cap and trade or a cap and auction, is there any way at all that the market can be somehow tweaked to do the right thing here? Oh, sure. Um, I mean, just to, to pick on, on two things right off, right off the bat, I mean, one is Michael mentioned the problem uh, with uh, of, of promoting the right sorts of projects. And of course, the real story with litigation in the context of alternative energy projects is that litigation has been very used with those projects very effectively by people trying to stop them. Uh, a lot of the same laws and, 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 and litigation uh, hooks that historically were used to go after nuclear power plants or coal plants or whatever else are now very effectively used to go after wind farms, um, to go after uh, alternative uh, energy projects. And that's not just true with litigation, it's also true with regulation. And in a lot of cases, uh, one of the problems with getting technologies implemented, deployed in the field so, they can act, so we can actually see are they viable, can they compete, and so on, is the fact that we have a uh, regulatory and litigation uh, environment that makes it very difficult to do something new, particularly on a large scale. To give one example, the Cape Wind Project, uh, over 10 years ago, they were told they would have all their federal permits within 18 months. Uh, as of a few months ago, they lost yet another round of litigation because this time uh, the failing was the, interior, the, the, the quality of the Interior Department's consultation with the Federal Aviation Administration. Um, you look at the history of the Cape Wind litigation, it looks a lot like the, the history of litigation over the Teleco Dam. Um, and uh, with the one difference being is that Congress is unlikely to pass a legislative rider saying the Cape Wind project gets to go ahead irrespective of what the laws in the books say, which is what happened with, with the Teleco Dam. So certainly freeing up markets uh, in that respect creates more opportunities, more niches for new technologies to emerge. The second thing is that we need to recognize that if we care about climate change, we have to care about not how many coal plants there are in Texas. We have to care about greenhouse gas emissions, or not emissions even, greenhouse gas concentrations in the atmosphere. And the sorts of reductions we need to be talking about are, as a down payment, what was endorsed by the current administration was endorsed by the House, 80% reductions by the year 2050. That's emission levels that we haven't seen in this country in almost 100 years. It's per capita emission levels we haven't seen since Reconstruction. I think it's fair to say that's not going to happen if it's not relatively cheap and relatively easy to do. And one thing markets do very well is uh, deploy and distribute technologies that are capable of doing something more efficiently, more effectively, and less expensively than what it's replacing. That's how oil replaced electricity for purposes of automobility. There were electric recharging stations between DC and New York before there were gas stations. Um, it's why oil replaced whale, uh, petroleum replaced whale oil. It's why fiber optics replaced copper. To tremendous environmental benefit. Why wireless is in turn replaced fiber optics. If we want the sort of emission reductions that we need and the stabilization that we need, we need to be thinking about how do we unleash markets to facilitate and engineer that sort of transformation. Because anything short of that may do other things that we like, but it isn't going to stop climate change. Coal plants, shut them all down in the United States and you assume no replacement uh, greenhouse gas emissions, you've gotten half of where you want to be by 2050, which still isn't enough, isn't enough for the United States, let alone the world, let alone those places in Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa, in Latin America, where there's not only a need to, to not pollute, but also a need to have more energy, a need to have more economic development. And so we really should be looking to markets. And I don't mean things like cap and trade, I mean looking towards unleashing and encouraging and incentivizing markets uh, to, to push toward the sort of uh, uh, technological breakthroughs we need because everything else we're talking about doesn't meaningfully move us towards what has to be the goal if our goal is atmospheric stabilization. Which is, of course, the right goal. Um, I, I, we might come back to the one little word in the middle of that that was a sort of a non-market word but maybe important, incentivization. Uh, Adriana, uh, we now have certainly one of the two best and maybe the best environmental administrators ever who's, who's actually tried to become engaged in this issue. Do you think that there are things that Lisa Jackson should have done that she has not yet done? Well, 
you know, it's hard to know exactly what happens behind closed doors um, between the administration, between Lisa Jackson and President Obama. But in, in my opinion, and it's my personal opinion, she's done a wonderful job. And I think in the opinion of most environmentalists, she's done a wonderful job. Um, I, my concern is that it, uh, it was not front loaded enough. Um, it seemed that it took the EPA a while to get started and, and um, some of it had to do with the healthcare law and other priorities that the administration had. But um, I think right now they are, they're right on track. Um, one of the greatest disappointments and probably the only real one that we've seen recently was the o ozone decision, which was not theirs, which was came from the administration, um, not Lisa Jackson. Lisa Jackson had a proposal and it was knocked down. So again, she's she's really she's really done all that she can. Um, and I think we would have liked to see a little more strength from President Obama um, to back her to really stand strong and a little more clarity in uh, in that support, a little more vocal support from uh, the White House to her policies. But um, I think the only thing that, that we would love to see sooner rather than later, and I hope it, in, the, in the next uh, administration, in the next Obama administration we see it, is uh, existing coal-fired power plants, which you've mentioned, um, that would be that would make a big, big difference. Um, so right now I think she's just, she's really done a wonderful job. I couldn't think of anything that, um, that, that, I mean, there's always nitpicking and especially, but, but no, I think that she's just done a wonderful job, wonderful job. Michael, there's been a lot of experimentation at the state level, some regional things, some local things. We have clean fuel standards, clean electricity standards, uh, renewable portfolio standards, feed-in tariffs, uh, the, the, the Berkeley uh, building pattern. Are, are there things that if you had the power to pass them federally, we could learn from at the state and regional level that you'd like to see implemented on the federal side? Uh, yes. And, 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 and I suppose things that we should not do using this laboratory of democracy thing. Have, have we learned some lessons about stuff to avoid? I think that the renewable portfolio standards have been one of the biggest drivers of the growth of uh, wind and solar in the United States. The requirement that uh, electric utilities get a certain amount of their energy from renewable sources. That ought to be a federal requirement. Um, the uh, Waxman-Markey bill that uh, barely passed the House and died in the Senate had something like that. Senator Bingaman, uh, the outgoing chair of the Senate, um, uh, Energy Committee has uh, a proposal on the table for something like that where nationwide a certain large and hopefully growing percentage of the uh, electricity mix has to come from renewables and efficiency. I think it's quite important that efficiency be included in the mix because efficiency is far and away the most cost-effective way of meeting our energy needs and with the uh, lowest uh, externalities and, and, and there are many reasons why it would be uh, it should be uh, encouraged and, and maximized. But I think that we that the laboratory by the of the states really has shown that um, that these kinds of portfolio standards are quite effective, and I think they would be even more effective if they were imposed on a national basis that allowed the trading of credits among uh, utilities across state lines. So let the markets work. Let the lowest cost ways of achieving these objectives be found and let others uh, pay for it. Um, uh, and I think that that's a real potential. And it, it is possible that that kind of thing will be enacted. It is not yet stigmatized in the same way that some in Congress find a way of stigmatizing everything else good about environmental protection. Maybe, uh, maybe uh, all it's a matter of waiting for that to happen. Uh, but, uh, but that would be on the top of my list. Uh, a, a quick toot for those of you who don't do um, energy stuff all the time, when, when, when people say efficiency, you, it, it, in people's minds think maybe you're going to turn down the thermostat in the winter, turn out the lights when you leave uh, the room. The, the sorts of things that now can be done through efficiency and with the kind of market penetration that Jonathan was talking about are nothing less than staggering. I'm building a building right now in Seattle, and just for illustrative purposes, using an EUI, an energy use index, which is how contractors view new construction. It's kilo BTUs per square foot per year. The average existing building in Seattle has an EUI of 91. 
Seattle has a really good new energy code, maybe the toughest in the nation. Any building like mine that is built by that would have an EUI of 51. If you go into LEED, get LEED certified, LEED bronze, silver, gold, platinum. By the time you get to platinum, you drive it down to 32, and my building will have an EUI of 15. And people in it will be comfortable, they'll be productive, they will have everything that you could have in any other building. But if it's something that you can do to invest on that's cost effective at the margin in efficiency, we're doing it. It's, it's staggering the kinds of differences that these things can make. Steve, um, let's say that President Obama is reelected and that these various balloons that have been floated out there, uh, that Steve Chu is really sad about how long he's been away from basic science and would like to go back and do some, some serious physics again, and the Secretary of the Energy slot opens up. And one morning, <coughs> Obama you know, starts drinking really early and, uh, <laughs> and gives you a call and says, Steve, you've been involved in this energy thing one way or the other for a long time. I'd like you to be my new Secretary of Energy. And, and you actually took it. Um, what would be the two or three most important things that you would recommend to the president that you do? Wow. I, I'm not sure I can answer that. I mean, I, I've never even, it wouldn't even occur to me to uh, make recommendations. I, I think, uh, I mean, I, so I, I, that's a bad question for me. I, I think because I don't, I think he's got to focus on the economy. He can't do anything about climate change in the next four years. We've got to have, the economy's got to recover. Uh, I think, I don't know what he can do. Um, uh, so I, I don't know what I would recommend to him. Okay. I'd turn down the job. <laughs> <laughs> Probably the only person in Houston that would turn down that job. Yeah. Uh, Jonathan, let, let's say that he takes some serious dope and, 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 <laughs> and calls you and invites you. What, what would your two or three recommendations be? I was going to say, if, if I couldn't get by the vetting in the Bush administration, I don't think I'd have much hope in the Obama administration. <laughs> but um, I, mean, I think there are some things that can be done. And, and you know, there are hints of things that, that I'd be very supportive of that this administration has at least put on the table. And th I think there will be some opportunities, again, who, without regard to who's president, um, there will be some opportunities um, uh, after the election to do some bigger things. I mean, what, some things that I think should be done right away. Uh, one is um, the way we f try and fund technological research and development uh, needs to be completely rethought. Um, the way we do it now with uh, uh, awarding grants uh, is very good for universities like the one where I work. It's very good for the national labs. Uh, it's very good for centralized bureaucracies. It's very good for funding basic research. It's very good for political patronage and rent seeking. Uh, it's pretty awful at developing um, commercially viable technologies. Um, the Brookings Institute study from several years back, a technology pork barrel, is, is as true today as it was then. If we believe that there are uh, systemic reasons why markets underinvest in certain types of environmental technologies, and I think there are. Um, we know that the way you encourage such investment is not by getting a bunch of smart people to dole out money to a bunch of scientists and say, oh, go invent something. It's rather by offering large rewards to those who actually do. This is the way the patent system works. And the patent system is so effective, effective because we, we reward people substantially with super competitive returns if in fact they can come up with something that is commercially viable and marketable. Um, this is how the British uh, Empire uh, solved the problem of longitude. Uh, this is how the Napoleonic Empire figured out how to uh, feed an army that was spread across Europe uh, occupying unfriendly land. This is how NASA figured out how to come up with a better glove for astronauts. Uh, you offer prizes. You offer super competitive returns to those who are successful. Why is it the sort of thing that an administration could do now? Well, because from the standpoint of, of our fiscal situation, what you are saying is instead of giving up the money, out the money now, we're going to hold on to the money until you've actually produced something that has social value. So the folks that are concerned about Solyndra and so on now actually know, okay, well, when the taxpayers, taxpayer dollars get spent, we're actually getting something. Uh, we also know from the experience of things like the, um, uh, the Ansari X Prize, um, which led to, has led to now um, commercial space flight, um, that you get a dramatic multiplier, which you don't get 
with traditional R&D. So that's something that the next Secretary of Energy could do. And I should say, to this administration's credit, very early on, the Office of Management and Budget issued a memorandum pointing out that a lot of federal agencies have far more authority to do this sort of thing than they have recognized. And, and, we, and, and we understand why agencies would prefer to give out money when you know who's getting the money as opposed to offering a prize. That's one thing. The second thing, and I, I, uh, just really quickly, we know at some point in the next several years there will probably have to be some grand bargain on fiscal policy in terms of spending and taxation. And we also know that economists for decades have been saying that a relatively simple consumption-based tax is far better than an income tax, far better than the, than the taxes we use to support Social Security and so on. And a lot of these, a lot of very conservative economists have been saying this for so long. Arthur Laffer, the father of supply side economics, has said dollar for dollar getting rid of wage taxes and income taxes and replacing them with the carbon tax is a deal we should take. Steve Moore, editorial writer for the Wall Street Journal, one of the founders of the Club for Growth, has similarly endorsed that exact same idea. So there is an idea, an opportunity for the next president to, as part of a grand fiscal bargain, to say, we will shift our taxes away from taxes on labor and, and income and wealth creation and onto consumption, particularly consumption of energy. Uh, the key for that to be remotely politically viable um, in the sort of Congress we're likely to get are two things. One, it's revenue neutral. The money doesn't come here. The money gets rebated back. Jim Hansen, this NASA scientist, has proposed this, uh, calling it a, a, cap and or a tax and dividend, that the money goes back on a per, per, per capita basis. Why? Because then all you're doing is shifting the incidence of taxes away from labor and, and wealth generation and on to consumption, which is what we want from an environmental standpoint. And it, it, and it reduces the concerns about is the money going to be spent in, in, in a productive way. Um, so that's a key. The other key is that it be as transparent and simple as possible. Something like that like that, that emerges looking like Waxman Markey, forget it. Um, because it doesn't take 2,000 pages to do something like this. Um, uh, Br British Columbia implemented a tax system like this uh, for the entire province in less time than it took EPA to implement cap the first stage of cap and trade for several dozen utilities uh, under the Clean Air Act for sulfur dioxide. Um, it can be done far simpler, and that, in this political environment, is important. You show up with a 2,000-page bill, forget it. You show up with a 30-page bill that people understand, that you could explain over the kitchen table to somebody, you can at least have a discussion. Um, at, at least I was a little bit confused, and so I will say what I think you said, though it was, um, I think, a little bit conflated, Jonathan. Uh, I think there were two powerful ideas in that last part, not one. One is to have a consumption tax that would replace, and, and a broad consumption tax, that would replace a tax on labor under the theory that you tax the stuff that you want less of mm -hmm. and you don't tax the stuff that you want more of. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's totally separate from them, a, a tax that would be put on carbon, which would, it, that tax would be rebated. The first tax, unless I'd you're going to shut down the government, can't be rebated. Well, you re I mean, if, if you're replacing them, I mean, it, it, you, if... A rebate has the effect of, of replacing, right? So, so, so administratively, if you leave all the taxes, other taxes we have on the books, either a consumption tax, a general consumption tax, or a pure carbon tax, and I'd accept either. If you, re, if you rebate it on a per capita basis, you are effectively replace, replacing one set of taxes with the other. Um, yeah. uh, it's just, it's just, it, it's just, you're doing it rather than saying, okay, we're going to try and figure, we're going to get rid of these taxes and then figure out what level of the new taxes we need to generate the same level of revenue, we're going to say we're going to keep the old taxes and then the, the new ones are going to be pure pasture. Okay. So everybody has the same income after taxes they had before the tax, but they're looking at a menu where things have different prices because now what is being taxed is anything that has energy in it directly or indirectly. Steve, you had a comment you wanted to make. Yeah, I, I, let me suggest a few things that I think we can do. That, I mean, this group can do, in fact. I think number one is we are still, we haven't won the public opinion battle. Yes. The climate deniers, the people are out there. Uh, two weeks ago, I went to my 50th reunion at Yale, and there was a panel of my classmates on global warming. Bill Riley was the uh, head of the EPA under Bush. He ran the panel. And there was a guy who's a lawyer with a big law firm in Denver, whose name I won't mention, but a reputable guy and a reputable lawyer. And this guy begins talking, and he was clearly, it was the party line off that, what's that website of the deniers that it's called, this foundation, the uh, American, 
There's a foundation that has the climate denial signs you can find on the website. So, um, and it was amazing, this guy's argument. He said, well, he's not persuaded that global warming is a problem, that we are experiencing anything other than, and it was amazing how many of my classmates, uh, you know, are not totally sold yet uh, on the fact, uh, you know, they keep quoting this, there were th 900 or 1,000 scientists that signed something, these are all bogus scientists, you know. Uh, Riley finally came, I was shocked because I, sa I said to the panel, I said, I don't believe you let this guy on here and no one to defend the other side. Well, Bill, Bill Riley eventually came and said, he said, all those scientists, they haven't done a single peer review paper. It, they're just, you know, they're scientists who have signed this letter claiming. So, I mean, we need to fight that battle. And the problem we need to do, we first need to find a leader. Uh, I thought Al Gore was going to be our leader. He could have been our leader. But we haven't heard from him very much. He's kind of sketchy. I don't know where what Al's doing right now. And I'm concerned because he would have been a great leader, okay? He, he could have been a president. We wouldn't have this real problem, all the problems we have, but he wasn't that, so why isn't he leading this movement more visibly than he is? So we need to find a leader. To find a leader, we gotta make some allies. We gotta, you know, like, I, I believe that one of the biggest allies on fighting global warming and cl climatic, uh, climate change is the natural gas industry. Natural gas ain't perfect, but it's a hell of a lot better than coal. And at prices now, it's a very viable source of generating electricity. And there are a lot of rich people in my state of Texas that would now uh, join the fight uh, against coal uh, because it's in their economic interest to do so. Uh, and the religious right is another. I mean, if you hear, they are getting involved in this. They were, you know, they believe that God put us here to be stewards of natural resources. And uh, there's another area that you would not normally think the progressive community should ally with. So, I mean, we need to figure a way to get all these environmental organizations uh, united and get a leader. On specific things we can do, uh, one is, I heard this, I mean, I, I didn't even know. Uh, I went on this trip in February to Antarctica with Al Gore, the Climate Reality Project to the Antarctica, and Hansen and these other global, a whole lot of scientists were there. And they are still being, the scientists that really have been outspoken on climate change are still being harassed a lot. They're being harassed by the government. They're being harassed by their educational institutions that they work for. You know, like being denied promotions. Hanson's always been harassed. So I would like to suggest that this group here in this room be the formation of a legal defense uh, clinic, kind of uh, legal, you know, uh, legal aid for climate scientists uh, to defend them when they are threatened by, and they will be threatened. And when, um, with citizens, when Citizens United, when those people put their money on this issue, wow, there's going to be a lot of work for us lawyers to do, to defend these people. And the final thing, the thing that I think will be the key to turning around public opinion, besides doing the other two things, uh, and the environmental people say that they want this, is they are dying to get hold of the uh, climate papers like the tobacco papers. Because I know from the defending of the tobacco companies that what brought them down was the allegations of a conspiracy, which we have, by the way, in the Kipolina case. I mean, uh, we're trying to use our conspiracy allegations to say it's not just a nuisance case. It's a conspiracy case. These defendants, these 24 defendants, conspired to, d to suppress the truth about the connection between carbon dioxide and global warming. And we're trying to say a conspiracy case is different. That conspiracy cause of action doesn't get preempted. The EPA doesn't preempt conspiracy. It may preempt some, you know, this is a conspiracy case. Uh, so, um, and there's some pretty good evidence. I mean, Hanson helped us write our complaint uh, from websites. There, it's available on the websites about how particularly Exxon was a very bad player in all this. Um, uh, and, and so, but we need to find, uh, we need to find a whistleblower, a deep throat, 
in the energy in, with the coal companies or the energy companies or the electric utility companies, and that doesn't take much money. All we got to do is hire Crow International and give them a hundred thousand dollars, and say go out there and find us someone who had who left one of these companies with a with their hard drive, you know, with the with some documents. Uh, and if we break that, the American public, even the conservatives, I mean, even the most conservative people in this country, they don't like people to cheat and lie. And so I don't want to be, I don't want to be in favor of clean air. I want to be against cheating and lying. That's the way I want to message. You know, we need to message ourselves. We're against these people who lied to the American public. And I can get the information for less than $100,000. So think about that. These are concrete things that we could do. We'll have Absolutely. to get you a donor. <laughs> yes. No, I, actually, I think we've got a fair number of instances that we could all cite where they have lied to us. The whole Global Climate Coalition was a body of lies. Adriana, a, a few uh, quick remarks, and then we're going to be asking one final question of the panel and then go to the audience. Really briefly, wonderful comments, those. I, I really agree that the biggest fight is to fight the climate deniers because that's picking up so much steam. I mean, they have been for a long time. We fought back, fought back, but it's really... The latest I've heard is um, just remember that for a long time the consensus was the earth was flat. So just because all these scientists are saying global warming is a reality. That's what Rick Perry said mean, in the yeah, debates. Like that. I know. <laughs> <laughs> My <So>, governor. <laughs> but those kinds of, of, of one-liners are what get people. And that's what sticks with people. And that's what they remember. And it doesn't matter how, how educated you are. The majority of the American public likes those one-liners, so I think that you're right, absolutely. Fighting those falsities and calling out the cheating and lying now, not being afraid to do that. This is something we still grapple with within the environmental community, calling them out. But I think you're right, that and a leader who is strong enough to call them out, um, <laughs> and with a lot of lawyers to defend him when they do, uh, is exactly what we need. I just wanted to apply those comments. It's wonderful. Uh, when, when I've been sitting in the audience, I suddenly realized that I, I'm much more interested in what I and the other people in the audience were going to ask than one more question from me. Why don't we just go straight to the audience now? Yes. Okay, great. What a fantastic story. Oh, sorry. I think my voice would carry, but uh, thank you. Uh, remember, even if you've got a really powerful voice, we're recording this on a camera, so you still need the microphone. Excellent. Thank you. What a great panel. Thank you so much. It really gives me hope. And um, I had, I just want to tell you that I, I have a question at the end of this, but I had dinners last night, and there was an attorney sitting to my right, and he had one of these vegetarian tags for dinner. And I said, how come you're a vegetarian? And he said, because of the environment. And so the real inconvenient truth is that eating meat is contributing at least as much to global warming as all of the coal-fired plants and the trucks and the cars in the world. And there was a report that was issued by the United Nations. Hi, how are you? Uh, uh, in 2006, called Livestock's Long Shadow, which came out with statistics on this. And they actually came out with two different reports. Um, and what's interesting is that we were talking about, you were talking about markets, leave things up to the markets and have people come up with information and, and disclose information, as, as you were saying, Mr. Sussman. The problem is that there have now been a number of undercover investigations at factory farms, and now there is a growing movement to actually criminalize the people who are providing these undercover, uh, undercover films. And actually, there's now a law called the Animal Enterprise Terrorism Act, which actually provides terrorism enhancements for people who are doing just that and affecting corporate profits. So in any event, my question is, what do you think about factory farming and about that as being a, a really tangible way of, right now, changing climate? I, it is true that um, eating meat is, is a phenomenally inefficient way of, uh, of creating, of having protein, and that a significant portion of greenhouse gases are attributable to, uh, to meat. I don't know that factory farming itself is, is a less environmentally efficient way of, uh, of producing meat. It has all kinds of other 
environmentally horrific problems, but as a climate matter, uh, I'm not sure that it's worse. I mean, theoretically, you could capture the methane emissions in a, a more efficient way than, than is otherwise. But I mean, I, I think again, the the issue is the inefficiency of creating meat by uh, creating food by growing a whole lot of grain and then feeding it to animals and, and getting a tiny fraction of it back. I don't think it's the I don't think the factory part of it is the uh, is the greenhouse gas uh, negative part. Um, well, just a, a quick comment. There are 93 million cows in the United States. We have two and a half times as much cow as we have people. Uh, it's a huge part of the American diet, and you're right, the, the impacts are spectacular. You couldn't get it to be comparable to coal unless you include everything that's indirect as well. This isn't just the, the stuff that goes into the cow and the processing of it. It's all of the electricity, all of the transportation. All, but maybe you could get up to that sort of a number, but I, I, that, that's a really big number you're coming up with. <laughs> but it's, it's, it's a big part of the problem. I, I, there's a, um, a wonderful little anecdote when... Um, Bruce Baba was Secretary of Interior, and they came up with this anti-grazing regulation, and part of his great courageous stance as a cabinet member was to go out and hold hearings in cow country about this, this thing where you'd start charging substantially more for grazing on federal lands. Went to his very first hearing, and the very first person that came up came up and did a, a, a talk, basically more than a question, on vegetarianism. And, and in the process, maybe overstated a little bit by saying that this would also be the answer to world peace, it would end all environmental problems, and on and on and on. Next person comes up is this grizzled old guy, obviously a rancher, and he says, Mr. Secretary, I got some stuff I want to say, but, but first I need to respond to the woman just ahead of me. Something you got to know is, is vegetables are not food. He says, vegetables are what food eats. <laughs> One of the all-time great lines. Clearly a part of the problem. Other questions or comments? Yes. Yeah, so I was uh, wondering, uh, even if the United States were to cut emissions to zero, how do we legally uh, address problems with other <coughs> countries, uh, especially China and India, on the rise with uh, this kind of production? How do we do it legally? <laughs> I mean, there is no, there is no um, uh, internet, set of international institutions capable of dealing with that in a kind of a litigation standpoint. And uh, even if such an institution exists, it wouldn't be enforceable. Um, and the reality is that China, India, Brazil, and you can just keep going on, will not, if they have to choose between economic growth and reducing greenhouse gas emissions, they will choose economic growth. And... Uh, insofar as they think they can do both, they might try both. But, if, but every time they have to choose, they're going to choose economic growth. And, and the dirty secret is, is that we have yet to see a country in the world act consciously make a different choice than that. That is to say, we've seen countries reduce greenhouse gas emissions due to other things that, had other that they had other reasons to do. Right? West, when Germany uni reunified, shutting down a lot of really old, inefficient Soviet-era factories reduced greenhouse gas emissions for Germany, but they didn't do it for environmental reasons. There were very obvious economic reasons for doing it. Same thing with ending coal subsidies in England and so on. Um, and, and so if we're concerned about China, who's now the, the leading, world's leading emitter of greenhouse gases, and we're concerned about those that are coming next, India, Brazil, and so on and so on, we need to be concerned about how do we make it possible for them to have economic growth in a low-carbon way and, and I would argue we have to be honest with the fact that at the present time, we have no clue. And so if we don't focus on solving that, it won't matter because the United States could disappear tomorrow, our greenhouse gas emissions could go to zero tomorrow, and the projections for global concentrations will still march upward. Well, and and until, we reckon that, until, we, until we realize that that is the goal and that's where we, focus our, we need to focus our efforts, I, don't, I would argue I don't think we're, we're really taking the issue seriously as, as the issue itself presents itself. And this is the last point in terms of how do we cross coalitions or, or break broader coalitions. Uh, to really Steve, Steve's point, you know, I spend a lot of time with, with folks of very different ideological persuasion. And the comment you hear a lot is, I take a lot of these environmental concerns a lot more seriously if the solution to every problem wasn't always the exact same. If environmental groups said they were, are really concerned about 
um, about uh, uh, emissions from, from certain sources of carbon fuel? How come when Paul Ryan is trying to cut the budget, how come they aren't there day one with a stack of federal spending which subsidizes greenhouse gas emissions? I know they when were. I worked in they DC, were. When, I, I when I worked in, in DC, yeah. it was like pulling teeth to get serious effort on those issues uh, 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 from environmental groups. There were, there were token things like the Green Scissors Project, but they were token. Um, and and um, that's, not where, that's not where the investment was made. And, and, and the reality is there are a lot of things we can do about greenhouse gas emissions, which don't involve giving the EPA more power. But, uh, there were major efforts power. by the environmental community to cut back on fossil fuel subsidies. Absolutely. But let me just say something on, on, on China, that, that I agree with you uh, on China, but the, the United States is, on the one hand, bemoaning that the greenhouse gas emissions in China are greatly increasing, which they are. But on the other hand, China is leading the world on the development of renewable energy technologies, and the principal U.S. response to that is to try to seek trade sanctions against China, which saying that they're, uh, that they're uh, subsidizing renewables too much. Uh, and I think there is a real disconnect there. Now, no, some, some of it is, um, there, there, there's some local content things which are problematic, but overall, I think that the uh, tremendous Chinese subsidies to renewables should be applauded, not sanctioned. Absolutely. Yeah, I could put some numbers on that, um, just to make it, uh, just 10 seconds, Stephen. Uh, last year, China produced more than half of all the solar electric modules in the world, uh, and it's actual sales inside China have doubled each of the last five years. So it's getting to be a kind of formidable. It installed something approaching half of all the wind turbines in the world that were installed last year. Uh, in things like solar water heaters, it's up over 90% of all things in the world. Now they're growing like crazy, their economy is exploding. But the thought that, that we have to do something and show it to them was the thought that I had in 1978. We were gonna be preparing this broad array of clean energy technologies that we could sell to the world and share to the world to give them that positive alternative. Right now, we're buying it from a great many places. Though the basic technology in each of those things were invented here with taxpayers' dollars. There's not a single photovoltaic material currently commercially available that was not invented in the United States with taxpayers' dollars. Steve. Well, you know, a lot of people that went on this Antarctica trip uh, in February asked the question, well, why should we even do anything here? Because, you know, we're, our, our fate is at the hand of the Chinese and the Indians. I mean, you know, whatever we do is not going to keep the, the atmosphere from burning up. And I learned something. I mean, we all learned something because the woman who runs the United Nations program and uh, in, is in charge of climate change, their program, said that the Chinese have been very good on, very good on concern about carbon emissions. And in fact, it's easier to work with China than it is in the United States because China, you don't have to get public, you know, you don't have to get public consensus <coughs> like you do here. The Chinese leaders, you just have to get an enlightened leader who says, yeah, this is the right thing to do, and it gets done. And so they really think in, in I wished I had the particulars, but it would be an interesting thing, and we should encourage this to be done by environmental groups who want to control opinion, is they should advertise the things, positive things that are being done in China, in India, so that our people, and the Amer Americans don't feel, well, why in the hell are we being called on to make these sacrifices? Uh, it's not gonna ultimately make any difference. Uh, I, I just think that's another thing we need to publicize. But we and we, I, I, what is affirmatively happening good in China? Um, to to blend Steve with Jonathan, which is I, I think something of a tribute to my blending abilities. Um, but by putting them together, the the actual numbers on that would would fall in very much with what Jonathan was saying. Um, the Chinese, over the course of the last five years, as part of their five-year plan, had as a goal to reduce the energy intensity of their production by 20%. They fell short of it, but they reduced it by 18%. So there's 18% less carbon dioxide associated with every dollar's worth of product now than there was five years ago, and for the next five years. And they take these plans really seriously. The Chinese government is like General Electric. You go someplace for five years, another place for five years. If you keep on succeeding, you move up through the system. If you don't, then you 
well, there it's a little more bleak than at General Electric if you don't move up through the system. But, but the five-year plans are, are really important. The next five years is going for another 20% reduction. But linking that to what Jonathan was saying, their economy is growing so rapidly that despite that increase in energy intensity per unit, the CO2 emissions have been continuing to go up. But the economy is slowing down. You can't grow at this rate forever. And I, I think when they install their consumption tax, uh, this thing will come into equilibrium. Sir. <coughs> Well, uh, given some of the general pessimism about the prospects of actually solving the problem on a worldwide basis, I guess my question is looking from the, and I agree with everything that you said, and of course we should be trying to do that, uh, but I'm wondering whether you, you have given consideration or think it's worth talking about focusing a little bit more on dealing with the global warming that's coming and what we can do about it to ameliorate the effects of it, uh, not just <coughs> continuing to talk about fighting the battle against it, which uh, is a bit Don Quixote-ish, uh, perhaps, in some ways, and, and try and spend some larger percentage of, of effort and money on dealing with, okay, if it's happening, how can we, what can we do about it so that the effects won't be as disastrous as some people predict they are? I think that's absolutely essential. I think that the uh, it used to be politically incorrect to talk about adaptation to climate change because it was seen as taking away from mitigation. But the projections all make it very clear that regardless mm -hmm. of how much we reduce our greenhouse gas emissions, the climate is going to get a lot worse before it gets better. And so a whole host of adaptation uh, measures are needed from strengthening infrastructure in many ways to uh, uh, tr restricting coastal development to changes in our water supply system and our um, in our crop selection, in a whole host of areas. So that is now beginning to, um, uh, to get um, more attention. Uh, in uh, in uh, late August or early September, the American Bar Association is going to publish a book called The Law of Adaptation to Climate Change, which I edited. Um, and, but uh, it, it deserves the uh, increased attention that it's, uh, gonna, uh, that it's about to get. I would certainly agree with that. One thing I would add, though, is that we should be wary of the idea that adaptation necessarily requires a centralized top-down response. And in a lot of cases, that's the last thing we want. Coastal development is certainly an issue with regard to climate change. Why do we have so much? Well, we subsidize it. Why do we keep getting more? Because we subsidize it even more. Um, you know, that's, that's, that ending the subsidization of, of development in harm's way should be a no-brainer. Um, increasing use of water markets to increase the, the, the dynamic nature of water allocation systems, particularly in the Western United States, should be a no-brainer. The UN IPCC endorsed it and said that is the most effective institutional response to water scarcity issues that climate change is going to produce. That doesn't require uh, massive investment. It doesn't require uh, a lot of, in a lot of cases, it requires removing barriers to, to things that would otherwise occur. So adaptation is something we need to spend a lot of time on. But we also need to be very broad in our, in our conception of what allowing, encouraging, and facilitating adaptation actually involves. And I think it's worth saying that those decentralized things that we were talking about in cities and states are now focused an awful lot of the attention upon that kind of decentralized distributed adaptation. Having said that, we also can't run away from the fact that there's a limit to what you can do. I mean, they're, they're the rich alluvial valleys and all of the rivers in the world that flow into the oceans are the, probably the richest topsoil best agricultural production on the planet. That's basically gone. Much of Bangladesh is going to become environmental refugees, and nobody is eager to take them. I mean, we had three million people driven by the Dust Bowl into California. Where in the hell are you going to put Bangladesh? I mean, we, we're, we're having already an epidemic of extinction around the planet. You know, these, the, the boundaries are moving more rapidly than particularly plants, but also a lot of animals can adapt to it, either north or up. So we're, we're going to have some catastrophic results, even if we do everything we can think of to do in terms of adaptation. But you're right, we should do everything we can think of. I think we have now run out of time. Oops, no, we've okay. almost run out of time. No, it's fine. Okay. <laughs> we have then run out of time. Run out of time. Uh, but we'll have 45 minutes more of meet and greet and mingle at wherever we told you before it would be. <laughs> Boyer? Boyer? Foyer. Foyer. In the foyer. Okay, <coughs> good. Thank you all for coming.